The psychedelic revolution is here. If you want to integrate your visionary experiences into your purpose, get clear on your entrepreneurial path and help people while you do what you love, then this podcast is for you. Welcome to The Psychedelic Entrepreneur, medicine for these times. I'm your host, Beth Weinstein. I'm a spiritual business coach, three-time entrepreneur, and a lifelong student of psychedelics and sacred plant medicines. You carry your own unique medicine, and your medicine is what we need for these times. This podcast will help you to share your medicine so you can create transformation in the world. Listen in on conversations with psychedelic leaders, change makers, and conscious entrepreneurs who are living proof that a better world is possible when you follow your heart and live in alignment with your soul. Hello, everyone. I'm Beth Weinstein. I'm a spiritual business coach helping you align with your purpose and grow your business so that you can help more people share your unique medicine and make a difference in the world doing work that you love. And today I'm very honored to have a very special guest, Wade Davis, with us here from Canada. Hi, Wade. Thank you for being here. Hi, Beth. Happy to be with you. So good to have you. I can't wait to dive in. So if you don't know Wade's work, you must. Uh, Wade Davis is a writer, photographer, and filmmaker whose work has taken him from the Amazon to Tibet, Africa to Australia, Polynesia to the Arctic. Explorer in residence at the National Geographic Society from 2000 to 2013, he is currently a professor of anthropology and the BC Leadership Chair in Cultures and Ecosystems at Risk at the University of British Columbia author of 23 books, including One River, The Wayfinders, and Into the Silence, winner of the 2012 Samuel Johnson Prize, the top nonfiction prize in the English language. He holds degrees in anthropology and biology and received his PhD in ethnobotany, all from Harvard University. His main film credits include Light at the Edge of the World, an eight-hour documentary series written and produced for the National Geographic Society. Davis, one of 20 honorary members of the Explorers Club, is the recipient of 12 honorary degrees, as well as the 2009 gold medal from the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, the 2011 Explorers Medal, the 2012 David Fairchild Medal for Botanical Exploration, the 2015 Centennial Medal of Harvard University, the 2017 Roy Chapman uh, Andrews Society's Distinguished Explorer Award, the 2017 Sir Christopher Andage Medal for Exploration, and the 2018 Mungo Park Medal from the Royal Scottish Geographical Society. In 2016, he was made a member of the Order of Canada. In 2018, he became an honorary citizen of Columbia. His latest book is Magdalena, River of Dreams, published by Knopf in 2020. And you could check out all his links and check out all his work. He has films online. There's incredible documentaries and beautiful talks that Wade has done over the years all over YouTube. So, Wade, thank you so much for being with us. Between you and Paul Stamets, I'm like, okay, these are the the two people I've interviewed who have the most awards on this planet. (laughs) So, Wade, you know, the, the purpose of this series is to talk about this intersection of you know, psychedelic, sacred plant medicines or sacred earth medicines and coming into this notion of purpose or soul's purpose. I'm curious, you know, I've heard bits of your story, but I'm, I'm curious if you, you know, what was your story and did you know what you were here to do when you were, let's say, like a teenager or a kid? And how did you end up creating this oh, life no. of travel? No I, think, no, I think that's one of the things that we often, Beth, um, do a disservice to young people by suggesting largely through our educational system that life is linear, you know, that you go from A to B to C, and if you skip D and E, you don't get to the rest of the alphabet. And anyone who's lived, a, I think, a, a fulfilled life knows that it's really based on those serendipitous moments, as Joseph Campbell famously said, that, you know, you've got to uh, you come to a crossroads and you've got to uh, follow your heart and you've got to find a way to cultivate that uh, inner compass so that at the end of your life, you look back on a life of your own creation. And that's indeed the, I think, the greatest creative challenge of the, is to be the architect of one's own life. And I'm nearly 70 years old. And when I look around at uh, friends and colleagues, those who are bitter are those who look back on a life of decisions imposed upon them 
And those who have found a certain kind of peace in their last decades or those who have looked back on a life where they may not have made the right choice always, or they may have made a few mistakes, but they own those mistakes. And so they own their own destiny. And this is, this is what I always say to young people, you know, never compromise and give your time, your destiny time to find you. So in my, my situation, I always was based on that. I mean, I, um, I mean, she, the, 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 she, the way my life unfolded is almost can't you, hard beyond belief. I mean, I, I went to Harvard because I used to fight forest fires in British Columbia when I was 15. And during Vietnam, our camps were full of these draft dodgers. And one of them had a, a Life magazine with the Harvard student strike on the cover of 1969. And I thought, well, that's got to be the cool place to go to be like these cool Americans. Because we were these obedient Canadian lads and these American draft dodgers would tell our bosses to piss off. It was irresistibly charismatic. So I applied to this school. I got in. And of course, my parents didn't have the money to go to Boston with me. And I landed at the Boston airport, at Logan Airport, and I realized I didn't know where Harvard was. And I asked this guy with a Harvard t-shirt on. He didn't know either. And uh, uh, so I found my way through the subway system to Harvard Square in 19... 19- 70. It was a complete madhouse of SDS and Harry Krishna and God knows what. Uh, no doubt people tripping. And uh, I realized that I was 10 days early and the dorms weren't open. So I, I had to drag my trunk through Cambridge till I found a church. I knocked on the door. A wonderful pastor opened it up and uh, I fell in love with America that moment. Uh, but he was a war resistor. His basement was filled with these characters fleeing to Canada. So I was radicalized the first days at, in the States. And then I um, spent the first year basically making trouble. Um, and when it came time to have to um, declare a major, I hadn't given it the slightest thought. And I happened to have come out of the Peabody Mu- Museum of Ethnology uh having visited it for the first time and with my mind still swirling with these dioramas of these shaman in every color of the rainbow uh, i ran into a friend in the street and i said stuart what are you going to major in tomorrow and he said anthropology and like forrest gump i said what's that and he said well you read about indians and i said well that'll do and that's how i started on to anthropology it's a true story and then after two and a half years of just reading about indigenous people in books i wanted to live with the indigenous people and i was in a cafe in harvard square with my roommate who was also studying anthropology also from the west and there was a map of the world, an actual geographic map of the world right beside us. And David suddenly looked up at me and he looked at the map and eventually pointed to the high Arctic. Well, I had to go somewhere and I watched my hand lift and it landed on the northwest Amazon of Colombia. Now, had I hit Italy, I might have become a Renaissance scholar. But having decided to go to Colombia, there was only one man to see, the legendary botanical explorer, Richard Evan Schulte, the man who sparked the psychedelic era with his discovery of the so-called magic mushrooms in Mexico in 1938. And I knocked on his fourth floor at Erie. And he was such an Anglophile that one of his colleagues said the only way for Schultes to go native would be to go to London. And uh, this, after all, was a man for whom mountains had been named in South America. Uh, He was the, uh, the greatest Amazonian explorer and spent 12 uninterrupted years in the Northwest Amazon uh, living amongst unknown peoples, traveling unknown rivers. And uh, I got as far as saying, sir, I'm from British Columbia. Well, he heard that adjective British, and he thought, that's good. And then he heard Columbia, and he thought I was talking about his beloved Columbia when I was talking about the problems of Canada. And I just said to him, I, I've saved up money in a logging camp, and I want to go to the Amazon as you did and collect plants. Now, at the time, I knew nothing of the Amazon. I had never taken a botany course in my life. I was 19 years old, and this man who Prince Philip had called the father of the Amazon just looked up across a mound of plant specimens through his antiquated bifocals and said very simply, well, son, when do you want to go? And two weeks later, I was in the Amazon where I stayed on that first sojourn for 15 months. And uh, funnily enough, back just before going to placate my poor mother in Victoria, a nice little English lady, she kept saying, can you get some more advice from Professor Schulte? Schulte's was sort of like her life ring, you know, her life rack or whatever for her son. Yet she had no idea what following Schulte's advice would actually mean because, you know, he said to me um, three points of advice. He said, don't don't bother with leather boots. All the snakes bite at the neck. And then he said, 
uh, to wear a pith helmet, which I wasn't going to do. And his third piece of advice was that I wasn't to come back from South America without trying ayahuasca, which I did. And, you know, it's interesting, Beth, it's, it's hard to remember, but it, in 1974, when I went uh, to Colombia on that first trip, you could say to people, I'm going to the Amazon, it was like you're saying you're going to the face of the moon, dark side of the moon. I mean, even in the wake of the psychedelic era of the late 60s, most people had never heard of ayahuasca. And it's interesting. I mean, if you'd asked me then which plant medicine would sort of take over the world, uh, yahe or ayahuasca would have been the last on my list. And it's interesting. But, you know, again, you know, it's interesting the role that psychedelics have played uh, in our lives. You know, it's curious, if, if you think of the fact that in my lifetime, and you're too young to really know what it was, a woman in the 1950s or 60s, you know, but uh, in my lifetime, women have gone from the kitchen to the boardroom, uh, people of color from the woodshed to the White House, uh, gay people from the um, closet to the altar, uh, you know, in terms of the environment, uh, just when I was young, just getting people to stop throwing garbage out of a car window was an environmental victory. Nobody spoke about the biosphere or biodiversity. Now these are terms that are familiar to school children. And many things have been catalytic in that transformation. Certainly the birth control pill played a major role in uh, giving women control of their bodies, vision from the earth from space brought home to us on Christmas Eve of 1968 by Apollo, gave us a whole new sense of the finite nature of this blue planet of ours. But it's interesting when we look at the ingredients in the recipe of that absolutely transformative period of social change, um, the one ingredient that is often expunged from the record, at least until recently, is that millions of us lay prostrate before the gates of awe having taken some psychedelic. And uh, unlike Bill Clinton, who famously denied having uh, inhaled marijuana, uh, I not only took these psychedelics, uh, I loved taking them, and they transformed my life. I would say that I wouldn't write the way I write, I wouldn't think the way I think, I wouldn't uh, have the relationship with the natural world that I do, I wouldn't understand the insights of either biology, ecology, or ethnology. The way I do, I certainly wouldn't understand the central premise of anthropology of cultural relativism, the idea that you know every culture is just a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human alive that you know the other peoples of the world are not failed attempts at being us? The idea that you know a culture, people are just products of their own cultural realities that have inherent uh, validity. Uh, all of that would have been beyond me. I think, uh, if I hadn't taken psychedelics, they, they transformed the way I thought about the world. You know, I, I remember in that era, you know, um, our parents were heavily influenced by the rhetoric of the war on drugs, which Nixon began in 1972, simply to create political advantage in that presidential campaign. Uh, but there was a lot of hysteria about LSD and rumors of this and that all part of an effort to shut down what was, in, in fact, a tremendously subversive movement. The catalyst of psychedelics was transforming the world. And so our parents, fearful, would say things to us, don't take these substances, you'll never come back the same. And what they didn't understand, that was a whole bloody point. <laughs> never come back the same. Yeah, because uh, I, I thank you so much for sharing this. This is an incredible story. And um, yeah, it's funny. My first experience was at 14 and I didn't even, you know, I didn't know what I was getting into. And looking back, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, but of course, you know, this was way back when and, you know, Nancy Reagan and the, the drug war back then had had a really big effect. And I thought that was the end, you know, but that's where I, I can see the whole trajectory of my life was shaped by this initial first experience. And then, of course, all the other experiences on top of that. Now, I have a question for you about, let's say, these first few times you drank ayahuasca way back then in the Amazon and how it shaped your work and how you view the world. And this is one of the reasons I actually was called to do this series. This is the fourth iteration of the series, four years in a row. And 
you know, it sounds a little cliche, but it came through the medicine while I was down in Peru on a dieta in the jungle. Um, and it came through actually on two dietas over and over, you know, like in a row. And um, my, you know, the vision was that if these medicines are helping us to realize that we are connected to, you know, plants, nature, the earth, each other, that we're all one, you know, the, the non-dual um, way of being, that maybe there's hope for our planet, you know, maybe there's hope for the, all the crises and the uncertainty and the chaos, especially that we're seeing more and more the last couple of years. Do you feel that the, this came through this medicine? And then also, what is it in the medicine that is inherently causing that, that effect? I mean, do you, do you know, like the no, explanation I think, I think, for this? No, I, think, I think it's important to, to, you know, the medicines are just a vehicle. They're like mm -hmm. the doorways to the gods. They aren't the gods. And, um, but what they do is um, open yourself to open the person to a, a transcendent reality that in the moment seems to be the real world and what the mundane uh, realm in which we dwell on an everyday basis is suddenly reduced to kind of a black and white, um, you know, facsimile of the of the glory of what exists in the universe. And uh, but I think you know one of the one of the things that certainly was useful for me was that you know we're all products of our culture and in our Western culture, when we liberate ourselves from the tyranny of absolute faith which it led to the Enlightenment when Descartes said that all that exists is mind and matter. In a single gesture, we kind of deanimated the world such that the flight of a bird could not have meaning, or as Saul Bellow said, science would make a house cleaning of belief. And we created this, this idea that the world was just sort of an inert space, lifeless upon which the human drama unfolded, right? Um, if plants and animals were anything, they were just theatrical supports for our play. Uh, and that that led to an, a, 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 a point of view about the natural world that, that is, is is evident everywhere in our extractive uh, practices, right? And and because the modern paradigm has been so powerful, has become so ubiquitous, we tend in a kind of almost ethnocentric way to think of it as the norm when viewed through the ethnographic lens, the ethnological lens, the anthropological lens, the way we view the natural world is highly anomalous. If you look around the world, most indigenous people have a very different relationship with the natural world based not on extraction, but reciprocity. That doesn't mean they don't have an impact on their environment, but that, that impact is mediated through an ongoing reciprocal sense of exchange, which of course is celebrated in ritual. A people like the Barasan and the Makuna, who use ayahuasca in ceremony, their most profound cultural insight uh, is that plants and animals are but people in another dimension of reality. Their shaman uh, are, are, do not serve the role of being a priest or a physician, as is often the kind of popular account of what a shaman is. They're much more like a nuclear engineer who periodically must go to the heart of the reactor to reprogram the world. You know, we use these terms like supernatural, the spirit realm, and it, it suggests that these people are journeying into some extra sensory space that non-tangible, which is sort of a profoundly Christian idea. It's like the same idea that there's this separate heaven that exists up there. But it's a complete misreading of what they are in fact doing. There is no supernatural realm. They simply move into the realm of the animals, the realm of plants, which are one and the same as the realm of people. And so you have this ongoing reciprocity, so that you know, uh, before a hunter can um, take prey, uh, the shaman must negotiate an arrangement with the master of the animals. Uh, a forest is not board feet and cellulose; it's the domain of the spirits. In the highlands of Peru, a mountain is not simply a pile of rock, but rather is an apu vidi that will direct the destiny of those within its shadow. And of course, the point isn't who's right and who's wrong. It's, it's that these ideas have profoundly different consequences, these beliefs uh, in terms of the ecological footprint of a society. You know, if you believe that a forest is just cellulose ready to be cut, that's what you'll do to the forest. If you believe that a mountain is just a pile of rock, you don't hesitate to tear it apart. And so part of what I think the psychedelics uh, have helped those of us from this Western lineage 
do is break out of it and and have a direct visceral almost orgiastic at times a connection to the natural world which defies that idea that a tree is but four feet or that a mountain is just rock we rediscover a new dream of the earth when we take these substances and that's why i've, I've always thought that the in the renaissance that's going on now happily uh, and the recognition of the utility of these substances, I think there's been a certain amount of exaggeration as to their potential. I mean, in other words, I think that, I think that without doubt, ecstasy um, can be profoundly helpful for post-traumatic stress, for couples therapy. I think some of the tryptamines can be useful for end-of-life care, uh, not el eliminating the fear of death, but helping us come to terms with it, perhaps. Um, but I think of all the healing uh, our needs that we have, um, the plants that really intrigue me are, are those mescaline-containing substances like San Pedro, which facilitate the ultimate healing we need to do, and that is with the earth itself. And there's no way that one can take a San Pedro cactus, for example, and not have have a visceral connection to the natural world that that was that that did not exist earlier in your life. I mean, I, I personally am fascinated that ayahuasca has become so popular because, um, you know, if you if you know most indigenous people, for example, and I've used ayahuasca uh, in traditional contexts um, many times in the Northwest Amazon, mostly with Makuna and the um, and the. Um, the Barasana, but also with the Kube and the Tucano and others, um, the Ingano, the Kamsa, they use very harsh language. You know, it's sort of like the, the, you're feeding at the breast of Jaguar mother when she rips you from the tip, flings you into a pit of vipers. I mean, it, I once was with the Kofan and we did a very traditional ceremony and there was a sort of spontaneous post-mortem in, in the morning. My good friend, Randy Borman, who was, was chief of Kofan, and that's a whole story, uh, was sort of translating from Kofan. And I said to the fellows, you know, you know, this stuff really terrifies me. And of course, it, he said, it's supposed to. That's what the thing is, you know. So I, ayahuasca is not for the faint hearted. Famously, when uh, William Burroughs went down to seek the ultimate mind bending high in 1952, and he hooked up with my professor Schultes, who took him to Mokoa and turned him on to Yahe. And Burroughs was terrified, and his veteran of a thousand strange scenes had only one cardinal thought, which was that the shaman was about to kill him. And he popped a bunch of barbiturates and fled the scene. I mean, uh, you know, ayahuasca is not for the faint-hearted. It, 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 it's supposed to bring you to the doors of hell. And I suppose if you move through those doors, um, there is a pathway to redemption and illumination. I've never particularly liked um, the doorway to hell. I might prefer the bucolic landscapes of the mind catalyzed by San Pedro. But again, each their own. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but um, it is interesting that this sort of modern um, use of ayahuasca, which is so centered on self, you know, I'm going down to a healing session, I'm going to heal myself. It's really quite the opposite amongst traditional societies. They use ayahuasca not as individuals or with any personal quest, but rather as a community um, in the in the midst of sort of three and four day ceremonies where the uh, individuals, for example, become not symbols of the ancestors, but literally become through a met spiritual metamorphosis, become the ancestors and fly off to the sacred sites to reaffirm their sense of commitment to the earth. Because in the Amazon, people are never seen as a problem or the solution. It's only through the human imagination that the world can be brought into being. And there's a constant dialogue between humans and the natural realm, whereby um, a give and take, which maintains the harmonic balance of the universe. But the, the humans are never the problem. They are, they are the, the essential solution because it's only humans who can, through ritual, maintain the, the the harmony of the natural world but so so ayahuasca is very much or yahe uh, it's not about the self um and so some of this um, modern use of ayahuasca is also just a projection of our own cultural obsession with self uh, um which which carry with us into the amazon 
and some people benefit from the use of ayahuasca and some people don't benefit and uh uh it, you know it is it, it is an ongoing issue because um ayahuasca is not for the faint harder mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, you mentioned psychedelics that are growing in popularity and you said happily. I noticed you said happily. And I'm wondering, you know, and there's and you also said like there's some problems, right? Or there is like extractive. I mean, even what you just said about ayahuasca for individual healing. I mean, it's in our modern world, or at least here in the Western world, maybe it's been taken out of this context because now everybody is just searching for you know, heal my depression, heal my anxiety, you know, solve all my problems. I'm, I'm well, sick of not, suffering. I mean, there's, nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with that because God knows we have a lot of those problems. <laughs> People can find salvation or or uh, good health um, uh, through the use of whatever practice, mm -hmm. more power to them. So I'm not in any way uh, denigrating the what's gr grown up around places like Iquitos. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying it's different from how these substances were used or are used by those who first um, elaborated them. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for pointing that out. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, as someone who's spent a lot of time in these cultures, in the Amazon, you know, do you know, are, what is the general view of now this huge exponential growth in the use of ayahuasca? And, um, you know, you, you mentioned extractive, and there's been arguments that, you know, here we are in the Western world now just extracting ayahuasca and, um, you know, affecting the ecosystem and, you know, potentially depending on how it's grown and how it's harvested, um, you know, maybe destroying the whole forest and the whole jungle canopy. I mean, no, well, I mean, I think that's a, it's not, yeah. it's not, it's not uh, going to destroy, excuse me, the jungle canopy, but I mean, it is, it is, a, it is an obvious challenge when um, psychedelics uh, become well known and popular. I mean, you know, Andy Weil and I wrote the first academic papers drawing attention um, to the Sonoran toad, while various, and at the time it was very obscure, and we we were really trying to encourage stu young people not to lick, let alone use bupo marinus, because the parotid glands on that toad are full of cardioactive steroids that can kill you. And we were just simply introducing into the scientific literature evidence of the first proven psychedelic agent from the animal kingdom, and we also suggested that if the Maya, for example, were using psychoactive toads, as had been suggested by people like Michael Coe, it would not have been Bufo marinus. It would have had to have been Bufo alvarius, because in those glands, you 15% of the content, an astonishing concentration, is pure 5 methoxydimethyltryptamine, a very powerful psychoactive agent. And it's an axiom of long-distance trade that the most valuable item is one that's easy to get at the point of origin, impossible to get at the point of exchange and is easy to transport. And a matchbox full of bufo alvarius venom would be hundreds and hundreds of hits of a very potent psychoactive agent. Uh, so we published those papers thinking we might get to the cover of Nature. We ended up on the cover of Wall Street Journal, accused of starting a new drug cult. And this was 1993. And we wrote back somewhat flippantly that we didn't think that um, the habit of having to secure a toad in the Sonoran Desert um, that was toxic to the touch and milking the venom from its parotid glands and drying it on glass and then smoking it was going to break out as a big drug cult in America. But how wrong we were. Shoot. And uh, and the, the pressure that has come on that natural species in a relatively small um, geographical range is significant, just as the pressure on the um, on the natural populations of peyote has become a serious concern in um, in, in the northern deserts of Me of Mexico, uh, and and ayahuasca can become an issue if if it's being harvested in the wild, and all of these things are just a consequence of the of the 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 growth of the consumption, the growth of the trade. But I mean, the, these are issues that can be addressed. Um, you know, I th I think the 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 exciting thing is that people are finally after what, 50 years or more of prohibition, being given a, a chance to experience these sacred substance, which human beings have sought out through all of our history. I mean, the fascinating thing about, if you look through the ethnographic record, you can see that the desire to periodically alter human consciousness through some technique of ecstasy 
is so ubiquitous in the human record that it's got to be seen as part of a basic human appetite. Now, that that basic appetite can be satiated through any number of means, meditation, dance, twirling about like the dervishes or ordeal. Um, but throughout the Americas in particular, it, it, human beings for the longest time have sought out these curious plants that have been used as vehicles, in a sense, to the divine. And to have that um, impulse um, quelled and the use of these plants um, prohibited um, did us no good. And the war on drugs in particular has consumed over a trillion dollars and there are more people in more places using worse drugs in worse ways than ever before. It's probably the greatest example of folly in the history of public policy. And yet it goes on and it goes on largely because the only people interested in it continuing are the DEA agents on the one hand who would be out of work if it ended and the cartels on the other who want drugs to be, remain illegal because of the, uh, the, the, the rivers of cash that flow into their coffers. And so the most important thing we can do in the wake of this um, renaissance in the use of these divine substances is to liberate all plants, liberate all drugs. And um, and uh, we'll probably see that illicit drug use will plummet because what you, what drives that economy, that market, is not the drugs, whatever that illicit drug is, as much as the money to be made through the illicit exchange of those drugs. So I think you'd actually find, for example, that if cocaine was legalized, consumption would plummet. If drugs were, in fact, legalized, we would perhaps not have on the market some of these synthetic substitutes, which are so incredibly dangerous, from fentanyl to um, opiates, right? All the opiates. And hopefully, this is just a harbinger of a of a process that will free um, all of these substances to be used by individuals. And as a society, we'll just have to take the consequences of that, good and bad. But the one thing we can be uh, sure of is that the negative consequences can't possibly be as deleterious as those of known to be from the war on drugs. It's good to hear that you sound optimistic about this. I mean, I really like this point of view and I like that you're actually sharing this because of course, there's other countries that have proven to, um, you know, have, you know, drugs decriminalize or legalize and been shown exactly what you said, that there's now a decrease in heroin overdoses or fentanyl or, um, you know, use and it's integrated into society well enough, you know, of course, there's probably always going to be some problems that exist. You know, so I love that there's some optimism here. You know, this is how I feel. But I'm curious, you know, the the tribes that you've spent time with down in Colombia or in South America, other parts of South America, you know, have you heard their views on this growth of, you know, ayahuasca tourism or the desire for well, ayahuasca I mean, I think, in the Western I mean, world? I think around Iquitos are probably more self-professed Shipibo shaman than yeah. they ever were Shipibo people in the yeah. forest of the Ucayali. <laughs> No, I think I think that um, you know indigenous people are not quaint and fragile. They're dynamic, powerful societies, and uh, they've been watching the Western kind of um, confusion around drugs for a very long time. I mean, uh, whether it was marijuana being grown in the '60s on the slopes of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta in Colombia, or or uh, the birth of the cocaine um, trade. Um, that was just uh, has caused so much agony in Colombia. You know, it's something that for people to think about. You know, everybody who's ever used illicit cocaine has blood on Colombian people on their hands. You know, four hundred fifty thousand dead, seven million displaced, a hundred thousand disappeared. Uh, you know, all because of our use of this horrible drug called cocaine. Um, and, and you know, indigenous people have have suffered from that um, as much as anybody else. And so there, I, I would say that their concern is less the, the co-optation of intellectual property in, in, in implicit in the use of I, or commercialization of ayahuasca. They would not be in favor of that, uh, but their greater concern is the consequences of the war on drugs on their own people and their children. Mm. Okay, that's that's good to hear. Um, you know, this is good to hear this one perspective of you know what's going on, how they feel, and how they're actually affected. 
What about the argument? Because I've heard, you know, there's I've been around this realm so long now that you keep hearing all the back and forth arguments. This argument that, you know, the Westerners who are bringing all the ayahuasca in or going down there in tourism, like they're so happy because now they have so much money, you know, like I've never been to Iquitos, but I've heard all about it. Um, but, you know, like now they're able to sell, you know, tapestries to people like me or, um, well, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, in, indigenous people are just human beings and they, they do what's necessary to do to stay alive and feed their families and maintain their, the integrity of their cultures to the extent that they can. So, you know, it, it's quite normal. It's like supply and demand. If the demand is there, then people will respond to the demand. And that's just clearly what's going on with the Shipibo community of the Ukayali. And they've been fortunate enough to be in and around, uh, a along with other indigenous groups, uh, the center where this seems to be unfolding, which is Iquitos, you know. Um, and uh, I'm sure there's other sites, you know, upriver, Pucalpa, and elsewhere. But, you know, there's a, a certain amount of the commercialization of these substances has been going on for forever. I mean, if you look at um, for example, um, the, the the book written between Ginsburg and William Burroughs, the Yahe Letters, was, which is probably what um, introduced most uh, young Americans to ayahuasca. There was, by the 1970s, uh, a, a kind of a trade whereby uh, gringos on the uh, on the road were turning up in uh, Sibandoy, going down to Mokoa, and along the road between Sibandoy and Mokoa were a number of places where curanderos had sort of set themselves up um, to do individual healing and to respond to this market. And it wasn't it wasn't a, a market that was generated alone by the traveling foreigners. There was always a folk market, as there is, for example, in the um, northern Peruvian towns of the coast, Chimbote and Chiclalo and others, you know, of of San Pedro Cactus. And again, the, these, these uh, healing cults, if you will, are, are generally um, syncretic fusions of, of pre-Columbian and, and, and Catholic beliefs. And, and, they, and, and if you go, for example, to the center of the San Pedro um, cult at Huancabamba, the so-called Cactus of the Four Winds, I mean, here's a plant that we know dates back to the prototypic civilization of Peru, Shavin, 2500 B.C., we can see an iconography at the type site of Shavin de Montar, a kind of wear jaguar figure with a stalk of San Pedro in its claw. I mean, in fact, there's some people who believe that the, the spread of Shavin, its first sort of horizon in pre-Columbian history in the Andes, was a spread not of a military sort, but rather of a religious idea sparked by the, the, the cactus. Some people think that in that sense, civilization in the Andes was to some extent born in the vision of San Pedro. Now, that was obviously a traditional use that um, um, we have no idea what the parameters of it were if it was in fact used in the state as a ritual or a, or a ritual item. But to this day in Huancabamba, you know, you know, uh, individuals come from all over Latin America and the world to work with the maestros and um and they bring to the maestros all sorts of problems economic personal social psychological physical health whatever bad fortune and they participate in a nocturnal ceremony where they ingest um, um relatively low doses of san pedro and during the subsequent hours diagnosis is made of their ailment and then treatment of the ailment um, occurs at the end of the second phase of the healing ritual when the acolytes complete a kind of pilgrimage to the sacred lakes, Las Waringas, which are high up in the Andes, where there's a sort of baptismal ceremony of purification. But it's a perfect kind of a, a, a expression of a kind of syncretic fusion of Catholic and pre-Columbian beliefs that is, is functioning today and serving the people of the continent today and not necessarily in a kind of indigenous context. So in other words, this idea of having a, a health center where the vehicle to well-being is a psychoactive substance um, that may in fact be used in a, in a context very distinct from where it was used originally has a long history in the Americas. Wow, incredible. I also, I feel like you just took me back to where I was three weeks ago. <laughs> I flew through uh, Chiclayo myself. 
Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, I, I have a question about uh, your views on this notion of sacred reciprocity. You know, there's a lot of listeners and this is listening who work with, let's say, ayahuasca or San Pedro or even, you know, maybe peyote, hopefully only in, um, you know, Native American church like context by personal projection there. Um, but what do you what do you feel like is uh, the right relationship to be in with these plant medicines? How can we give back, you know, especially with, you know, let's say ayahuasca or the Sonoran Desert Toad, and let's say it's a facilitator or somebody who's working with it quite often. You know, what do you what do you feel is the right relationship that one should have? Well, I think reciprocity just means you give as much as you take. And, um, you know, there are groups and foundations like the River Sticks Foundation working very hard to um, protect and expand um, natural populations of these substances, you know, um, and, and to, uh, to encourage people to use them in, in, um, in kind of sustainable ways, if you, were, you, if you will. Um, you know, I, I think with psychedelics, everybody has to find their own relationship. I mean, it, you know, some individuals, for example, uh, classically uh, Richard Albert, who became Ram Dass, um, famously said, you get the message and you hang up. I mean, for a lot of people, you don't have to go through repeated sessions with these substances to, to receive from them, if you will, their gifts. Other people feel that the use of these substances is an ongoing, lifelong experience of spiritual growth. That's great, too. Um, you know, I, I, I think that psychedelics can be um, um, also helpful or less helpful at various points in your life. I mean, for example, in my in my case, I found when I was sort of in my teens and um, in college and my early 20s, at a time when I was trying to kind of deconstruct the world into which I was born, I kind of had Baudelaire's illness, um, malady, the horror of home. I mean, I was trying to escape uh, the constraints of a kind of a loving but bourgeois background with the hope of finding somewhere on the open road uh, a, a road map to a place of greater authenticity and meaning to me. I think that's what propelled a lot of us in the 1960s. Um, but uh, when I was deconstructing that world into which I was born, I found psychedelics to be extraordinarily useful. And then, you know, it's like the Vedic scriptures, as you go through the phases of life and you become a householder, and as I became a householder and I married and I literally had a home and I was building a career, writing my books and, and becoming a father, for example, I, I was creating a world that I didn't want to shatter, you know. And so at that point, I found that psychedelics were causing me as much uh, anxiety, if you will, um, as they were illumination. So I just stopped using them with, with no judgment. And, uh, and you know, moved on to other forms of sort of, uh, uh, if you will, spiritual um, pursuit, you know, meditation. I think that's why a lot of people came out of the psychedelic movement and sound um, mean in, in, in the Buddhist Dharma, for example, as I did. Um, but that's not to judge anyone's choices today. And, and there's a part of me that, you know, is, you know, it's again back to the metaphor of the Vedic scriptures is that, you know, after you become a householder, you, you then are free to sort of in your last years of your life move on um, as a sadhu, you know, not, not abandoning home but renouncing ties to the past. And you, in India, for example, it's completely acceptable for a man to simply go off, you know, um, in anticipation of, of his death, uh, and women too, for that matter. Um, and I'm not about to abandon my family, but I like the idea that at this stage of my life, you know, nearly 70, um, I look forward to, you know, experimenting it, uh, with San Pedro again to see what it's got to teach me at this point in my life. Now, over the years, um, you know, I've taken ayahuasca and I've, I've, I've taken uh, toad medicine, but always kind of in the context uh, of being a writer. So, for example, uh, when I wrote the book One River, in order to, which I did in the early 1990s, uh, I wanted to remember what it was like to take ayahuasca, uh, and it hadn't it'd been the 19, you know, 20 years before. 
So I took ayahuasca in several settings just simply so I could write about it. And by the same token, um, I, I smoked the venom of the toad because we wanted to figure out what it was in, whether it was psychedelic or not. I mean, it was very much an academic exercise. I mean, that's how we used to do it, you know, inspired by Schultes. Schultes used to say that Jim Plum and I ate our way around South America. If we saw, when we were young, if we saw a plant that we thought was potentially psychoactive, we just ate it, see what happened. Um, and because of that, we discovered a lot of new hallucinogens. And our, we had a few mistakes as well. Um, but that was the spirit of the times and the mission that we were on. And, you know, in retrospect, it was it, 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 the kind of explosion of interest in psychedelics now um, reminds me of a time when we were really quite a small cadre. I mean, yes, of course, um, Timothy Leary had sort of unleashed LSD on, on you know, on the dead had done the acid test and um, psychedelics were everywhere in the 1960s. But in terms of these sort of mysterious plant medicines of the Amazon and elsewhere, they remained remarkably obscure. And it was really a glorious thing to be part of that small cadre of characters, you know, Mike Bale and Tim Plowman, Andy Weil, um, who gathered around the feet of this remarkable guy, Richard Evan Schultes, um, who has never gotten his due in terms of his contributions to his field. Um, he's particularly overlooked for reasons I don't understand in Michael's books and uh, the, the Netflix series. Uh, in the Netflix series, for example, it is suggested that Gordon Wasson just heard a rumor that there were mushrooms in Mexico. Uh, and that was a real distortion because the truth is that Schultes collected the first specimens in 1938. He wrote it up in 1939, 1940, an American anthropologist. And the, those papers came into the hands of Robert Graves, the poet, who sent the papers to Gordon Wasson and encouraged him to contact Schultes. He did. And Schultes sent him down to Oaxaca uh, into the hands of Maria Serena. So Schultes was absolutely critical both to that and also to the ultimate identification of reactive constituents by Albert Hoffman of both uh, Olorwiki, the serpent vine, the morning glory, and of course the Tehuanacatl, the mushrooms. And all of that history is, for reasons I don't understand, expunged from the record in the Netflix series. I suppose they, I don't know why they did that. There's a, I feel like there was a lot expunged from the Netflix series. <laughs> it was, it was, you know, short and made for the masses is the way I see it, you know. But, um, I, and there were a couple of things that I heard in that series that I don't, I personally don't agree with. Um, that they're brushing over a long, deep history in, in other realms as well. So I'm glad you, I, I'm very glad you got this clear. And I'm actually going to point this out as we uh, release this interview to the public to Make sure you listen to this one part, because I think it's actually really important. Um, so I'm curious, you know, as a, you know, ethnobotanist and talking about culture, what, what do you think the future, this is a big question, like, what do you think our Western world future has in store, you know, and where do the psychedelics play a part? Like, do you think we're going in a, I put well, this I in quotes, it, positive I, I, direction or? No, I, 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 you know, I, I wrote a book called The Wayfinders and, mm -hmm. I, and an editor put on a snappy title, uh, why ancient wisdom matters in the modern world, and I kind of had to answer that question, and uh, in in the book, and uh, I answered with two words: climate change. And what I meant by that is that the very existence of these alternative visions of life itself, um, um, uh, you know, it, all these visions of of, of, of hope, uh, different ways of thinking that the indigenous peoples of the world personify. You know, there's 7,000 languages spoken on Earth, you know, and every language is uh, more than vocabulary and grammar. It's a flash of the human spirit. It's a vehicle which the soul of a culture comes in the material world. Every language is an old growth forest of the mind, a, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of social and spiritual possibilities. And the very existence of these multiple voices of humanity put the lie to those of us in our own particular cultural lineage who say that we cannot change as we know we must change the fundamental way in which we inhabit the planet. I mean, this is the message of the vision of the Earth from space, space brought back by Apollo. This is the message of global climate change. We have no choice but to change our ways. And knowing that our way is not the only way 
uh, but it's just one of infinite sets of possibilities, gives us the freedom to make the changes that both ourselves and the planet itself demands. Mm. Do you do you have hope for the future? I always have hope because I'm a father, and, and you know, pessimism is an indulgence, a despair, <laughs> an insult to the imagination, just as orthodoxy is the enemy of invention. Mm. You know, we have to do what needs to be done and only later ask whether it was possible or permissible. If you're a living human being, you, you have to embrace hope. Now, that doesn't mean you're naive. I mean, one of the greatest lessons I ever got, and maybe a good place to end this, Beth, is that, you know, my father wasn't a religious man. Um, but, you know, we have this idea in the Judaic Christian, but particularly the Christian tradition, that there's good and evil in the world. You know, we have good in the child of God. We have evil in the fallen archangel, the devil. And we have this sort of dream that at some point we can bring these together and good will triumph over evil. This is kind of the illusion of Christianity. And um, so that, for example, in the, midi in the Middle Ages, if you ask the obvious question, if God's all-powerful, why does he allow evil to exist in the universe? You were burned at the stake for heresy. But when Lord Krishna, in a very different cultural context, was asked that question, if God's all-powerful, why does he allow evil to exist, Lord Christian said, to thicken the plot. In other words, what my father was saying, you know, he, he had said, look, son, there's good and evil in the world. Pick your side and get on with it. And what he was getting at is that we'll never eliminate evil. Um, evil and good walk hand in hand. Um, and the point of life is to pick your side with the hope that, as Martin Luther King said, the arc of history does bend toward the righteous. And I think, Beth, the reason that's so important today is that you know, the rhetoric of doom and gloom that has come out of the climate community has literally paralyzed your generation. Mm -hmm. People saying they're afraid to have children. I mean, this is such a disservice. There's no bigger disservice to a new generation than to say, oh, you missed the 60s. They were so great. Or the world's falling apart. It's up to you to fix it. You know, the big lie of every commencement speaker at a college. It's ridiculous. No. You know, to, 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 it, 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 the truth is that the world will go on. And what we need to do is recognize that we'll never triumph over evil, but our mission isn't to do so. And when you realize that you'll never win every battle, uh, and that sometimes you'll lose, but when you don't expect to win, then you never become bitter in a loss. And it just keeps you going. I mean, in my life, I've fought major environmental battles, for example, and some I've won and it's been glorious and some I've lost and it's been sad, but it doesn't stop me from going. And again, I'm almost 70 years old and I haven't lost any of my energy, any of my idealism, any of my spirit that I had when I was 20 years old running around the Amazon for Schultes. And it's because I never expect to win. And I realize it's like the pilgrim on the path. The destination is not a place, it's a state of mind. Right, And you cultivate a state of mind where all you're doing is doing what you can to serve, and this sounds a little precious, I suppose, but to serve the side of good. And that's what my father always said we ought to do. He said every church should have a billboard outside of it saying, important if true. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for sharing your beautiful wisdom. This is such an honor to have you here. I really appreciate your perspectives. I think this is definitely what the world needs to hear more than ever right now. So thank you very much for going and continuing to go and not taking vacations and <laughs> doing, the, doing the work because this is it. You know, this is where we're at. And um, your voice is very important. So thank you so much for sharing it. We appreciate well, having you well, here. Beth, thank you for giving me a platform for my voice. I, and good luck with all your work. Thank you. All the best. You too. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you're feeling inspired, I'd appreciate it if you showed your love with a review. And check out my YouTube channel where you can find the video version of this podcast. You can also head to BethAWeinstein.com to learn more about me and grab my free business growth trainings. Remember, you carry your own unique medicine and your medicine is what we need for these times. <laughs>